Hi, I'm Mike Dakoto from the Nolhegan Abenaki, and today I'm working on beading wampum beads. These are simulated glass beads, and I'm working on a wampum belt that will be given to the Confederacies later on this week. Um, it's an age-old process of beading and storytelling. It goes back to before we had a language, a written language, and each belt tells a story. And that was how they kept a record of their stories. So you'll have to forgive me, I have to keep count here. This particular design is created specifically for the Wabanaki Confederacy and for this specific conference <clears throat> and it represents the five nations of the Wabanaki Confederacy and the seven nations of the Seven Nations Confederacy and we're gathering under a peace conference uh, supported by the Abenaki people who are members of both confederacies. So that's the story this belt will tell. <coughs> this belt has nine rows of beads. And when finished, we'll have a total of 990 beads in it. The original belts are generally done with wampum, which comes from a shell found on the coast. It's a quahog shell, and it has variations of purples and whites. And the significance of those colors is determined by each belt that they're in. And every now and then we have a problem. In this particular belt, each row of beads is held in by two string, two separate strings, one across the top and one across the bottom.
Star and uh, I'm of the Nalhagen band, the Corsac band of Abenaki from Vermont, and I am committed with my art to uh, preserving tribal art and symbols and designs. And now I am trying to bring language into my work as well. And I've done the book on the visual language, and now I'm combining the visual language with actual word on my small ornaments and I hope to expand that on some of the larger pieces by either telling a story or a poem in Abenaki on one side and English on the other and um, that will that will be coming along shortly. <laughs> um, this is a little turtle and his word for him is Tolba and I also have heron Buffalo, eagle, and bear. And soon to come is Azaban, <laughs> our, our tricky little raccoon. Um, and there will be other designs as well with the words on um, whatever way I can preserve our language visually or uh, orally, I will do. I don't speak the language, but I can certainly use it visually with the help of aids. Okay, the first thing you do with a cord is that you have to, if you're going to open it, you clean it on the outside to remove molds that form on it. Some people think the gourd's no good if it has the molds. Actually, that's the natural way for it to go. So you have to wash it and I bleach it on the outside, then open it and do the same for the inside, removing all the insides and sanding inside and out. Then I lay it out in pencil and then I wood burn it because I use dyes. If you're painting, it's not so much a concern, but when you use the dyes, wood burning it first keeps the inks from spreading and, and going outside the design. I prefer the dyes over uh, uh, the acrylics, but there are certain colors, like yellow won't show up because the gourd is yellow. If I'm using blue, it'll turn green because of the gourd's yellow. So there are certain times I have to incorporate a little bit of that, uh, acrylic. Uh, they have a transparent acrylic now, which is good because yes. it kind of 
is in the same family as the dyes. And then when I'm all done, uh, it all dries and settles, and then I put uh, coats on it. Sometimes they're flat coats, sometimes they're uh, glossy coats, uh, depending upon what it is. And I like to, I'm, I'm also using more texture uh, to create the, uh, designs of its own. And that pretty nice to show you. Hang on. <laughs> you have the inside of the cords, I noticed some of them are black. Yes, I it's paint like them with acrylic because the acrylic helps to seal the gourd. Seal the inside needs to be sealed in some way, so we decided that acrylic was a, a adequate. You can also either spray a, a coating on it, a clear coating, or you can brush it. I prefer to brush it because I don't like sprays that much. I dribble. <laughs> I always get runs. <laughs> That's good. And as I said, the black brings out your hues on the upside of the door. One of the first, one of the first ones I did though, it was an, a, a fairly flat open bowl. I did the inside red, and it really looked gorgeous. It's still on my website, but it's sold. I think it's up at Mount Kearsage. And it was called The Bridge to Assimilation. And it had the double curve and tree symbols along the top. And it had lace around the bottom because our girls were taken over to Quebec and taught the amenities of civilization, one of which was to make lace. Musicians have told me that they don't like the harder uh, coating, so I use wax and you can always shine it up <laughs> and uh, it, it gives a better uh, sound. Big process. And these are all the handles. This is the way the gourd grows. Yes, these you it's can see some are curved. I like, yeah. I like the ones with curves oh, uh, because of course it, it makes it easier to hang Hold on to. Too. And um, the men like the larger ones. This one has an eagle on it. And these are all natural seeds. These are not filled. I sometimes use beads or bird shot or small stone, uh, depending what sound I want, or corn. These are corn. These are little rawhide that battles with corn in them. They're a little more natural and they have the horse hair on them. Of course, they're less expensive than the ones that are more artsy. <laughs> and this one you have going around, I take it the bottom that it's sitting on is the top of another gourd? Yes. <laughs> yes. That's beautiful. This is one of the things that I want to do more of. This yeah. is the story of Guscabe yes. fighting the water serpent. And it also tells the story of how Woodpecker got his red hat. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Guscabe could take any shape, size, or form. And he was sometimes good and sometimes not so good. But the, the villagers were having trouble with a serpent eating up all the fish in the lake, so uh, they came to him for help. And he had four uh, magic arrows and was told that he had to hit the serpent in the fork of the tail. Uh, he shot three of the arrows and they did hit it, but it did not kill him. So a little woodpecker flew up to the tail and said, up here, up here, up here. And in fact, he did hit in the tail. And Little Woodpecker was so exhausted, he came down and lit onto Guscape's canoe. And as he did, Guscape took the water and cooled the bird. And since the serpent's blood was in the water, that's how Woodpecker got his red head. Oh, that's such an awesome story. Yeah. But I, I like to tell our stories, and I'd like to do more. Yeah. I was collecting stories for like four years and I, I've got them all on my computer ready to go. <laughs> now I have a real studio. I was working in an extra bedroom before April I moved into a real studio to have more room for the larger pieces. Yeah, that helps. And storage. So you're doing many things. You're doing art and story forms and the teaching the language. So you're doing a lot. Well, it's really good. I think that that's what we can use our skills to to better our culture and 
in putting it in book form. Yeah, I could have kept it for myself and said, oh, these, I know these, and nobody else is going to know. But the next generation will not know. So put it in the book where they can go and get the information. Exactly. Um, I would like to do other uh, things. And it was also good for me because I interviewed seven uh, our other artists. I'm not, I'm the author, but I did not feature my work in the book. And the seven interviews that I did with other artists just reinforced me about my feelings and what I was doing and how I felt about it. And I just, when I got it all together, I just cried because it was like, you know, I'm not in touch with enough people to know how they feel. And, uh, you don't really share that much on the internet. No, it's hard to. So we did. I did most of this by emails and phone calls, and God bless them, they were great. That's wonderful. I got a, a New England Arts uh, Council um, grant to help me oh, wow. with the cost of it. That helps, yeah. Yeah. Good. It's a beautiful book. Thank you. I'm going to get one because it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so. you. Yeah. And it tells a lot. Yeah. As, you know, and, and, and what you're doing is helpful with the illumination of who we are. Because people think, you know, Abenakis, they're not here anymore, they're gone. That's, so that's everything true. we do helps people understand we're still here. Well, that, that was my, my feeling. I, I would go on the internet, I would go into books that were supposedly collections of native things, and the Abenaki weren't there. No. Uh, Iroquois, because uh, they have been very much in the fore, yep. but not Abnaki. I know. So I said, we're going to leave a footprint here. Good. Very important. And our children can carry that on, let's hope. My and son it, is doing that. And it's super funny because one of my first talks on genealogy was called Moccasin Tracks. <laughs> and then I, then I met her and I went, yes! <laughs> That was so funny. It's meant to be. Yeah. No. I was trying to uh, teach people how to uh, find their, their genealogy for natives in Upper New England and uh, Canada. Canada is so much easier than the states, believe me. But uh, yeah, that was a, that's why I say, you know, creator comes along and he drops seeds that you don't recognize until. <laughs> you wonder what you're doing one day and it's like, oh, why am I doing this? And then the next yeah. day you know. Yeah. That's happened to me a lot. I, uh, I had a friend named Jocelyn, her, her married name is Jocelyn. And she knew my struggle, you know, doing my genealogy and everything. And one night I was going through the trunk that my dad left me, and a little tiny piece of paper fell on the floor. And I was so, it was late at night, and she teaches, so I know she had to get up around. I called her up in tears. I said, you're not going to believe this. My father was born on Justin Street in New Bedford. Or Providence, I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and she and I had been teaching together for I don't know how long, and I had been searching the information, and somehow I just missed that little piece of paper. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it just went flying on the floor. It was yellow, and I'm like, oh, wow. A little message from the ancestors. Yes, definitely. It comes definitely. in different ways, doesn't it? Oh, always. Yeah, yeah. Always. Oh, I, could not, I could not have done my genealogy or my research or anything without the ancestors. Yeah. I mean, it, you look back and it's very apparent where the seeds were dropped for me to follow. Uh, just unbelievable things happen. It's wonderful. Yeah. And our ancestors have a strange way of communicating with us, don't they? You never yeah. know. Well, you have that, to pay attention. Well, that's what we were talking about yesterday <laughs> was the fact that you need to pay attention. Yeah. The things people say when the ancestors are speaking to you, they, they think that you're hearing voices. Um, they don't understand the communication is generally symbolic, like the seeds that are planted, yeah. and that it's it's really uh, something that you have to be aware of and open to. Yes. A lot of people do not understand the things they see. They ignore them. Go right on. But they say it's just a coincidence, or oh, you're yeah. making it up. And yes. my children and I sit down and talk. Oh. Like, 
Mom, when you go, how are you going to communicate with us? What are the signs? And what, are, what are you going to do? Because we know you will be there. And um, people in, the, in this day and age, in this society, don't believe our lives continue. And that's why they're all so, so angry and, and treat the world with such bad karma. If they knew that our lives kept going and going and going, they would look at life differently. I think they would. Yeah. I think they would. Because I know they'd be still around. Yeah, yeah. they'd figure they're here now, I'm going to get it while I can and yeah. enjoy life, and I don't care what happens when I'm gone. Exactly. And not realize, I, I, I've yeah. had a dream since I was very young, and sort of had it figured out and not figured out. I'm standing on a ledge underground, and there are two paths, and today's people are going down, and the ancestors are coming up. And I think what it, think what it means is that the ancestors are coming back to lead us, to tell us, to teach us, and why the people are going down, I, maybe they have to learn before they can rejoin us. I don't, I'm not sure what that is, but nobody seemed to know I was there. I was just watching this happen. It, it's, you know, it's, I'm still working on it, uh, but I do believe the ancestors are going to have to come back and lead us through those times oh, and sure. worse and worse. Yeah. I have a dream where I'm being constantly chased. It's a repetitive dream. It's more like a nightmare. Yeah. And people on horseback are chasing me, and I on horseback. I never get caught, and I manage to hide and work out what's happening to me, and then I have to dream again. So to me, that's a very significant thing about what's happening in this world. People are trying to get rid of us. Well, that's true. And, and you know, destroy a way of life. Fortunately, they haven't caught you. And they haven't caught me. And when I wake up, it's like, try that again. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> Well, I thank you very much for letting me share my work and for Dee sharing it as well. And I hope that you'll be continuing your work to keep us alive. I'll look for some of the other interviews you've done online at Moccasin Tracks. And thank you for sharing your knowledge. This was beautiful. You answered a lot of questions I had. So oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, Leone. <laughs> okay, my name is Bill Ball. I'm from New Jersey, but I'm a Mississippi tribe member from Swanton, Vermont. Uh, Mississippi is one of the four tribes that make up the Abenaki Nation. Uh, and we're on a Wobanaki conference here in Shelburne, uh, New Hampshire. Wobanaki is an accumulation of many different tribes. At one time, 200. Right now, we're down to about 29. Uh, my regalia, which I have on, is modeled after an Abenaki ceremonial dress around the 1800s. Uh, what the Abenaki did, people always think of the Indians as wearing uh, buckskin or leather, but they adapted many things after the French came here. The French came in the 1500s, and the uh, Indians were smart enough to realize that, hey, wool, is a lot warmer than uh, skins would be. So this is about 1800. This is modeled after a French military uniform. It's made out of wool and beadwork. The colors, red and black, were very familiar colors to the Abenaki, two of their most uh, popular colors. Some of the others, yellow, green, or blue, were harder to reproduce. Uh, and these colors were not, so they stayed with them. Um, I'm going to turn around and show you. This is a, a pouch. They were a um, nomadic people. They, uh, they stayed in Swanton, but by the Swanton River, which is, uh, leads into Lake Champlain. And they would go there in the summer, they would fish, and they would plant some uh, uh, products, some corn, and so forth. Then when the winter came on, they would move away from there into the warmer aspects and build maybe a long house uh, in the woods. Uh, and a couple of families would team up together. Uh, again, so because they moved, they didn't. They left a lot of uh, their belongings in one location. So they would carry. Uh, you would see like a pouch like this, filled with their family things, or baskets. 
uh, the Abenakis and all the Wabanaki of the Northeast made a lot of baskets and they would carry their, uh, their food and their belongings from one site to another. I'm going to turn around and show you. This is a, a, a pouch. Some people call it a band. Okay. This is only this is only half of what's called regalia, because we're this is taking place in Shelburne in the summer. It's about 90 degrees right now, and like I said before, it's made out of wool. But there are leggings that go with it, and a breech clap, also made out of wool. And then your moccasins. If this were held in cooler weather, uh, I would have the rest of the uh, regalia on. Um, this meeting that we're having here now is, is very exciting. It's the first time in many, many years that the, uh, the Wobanaki, which again, like I said, is all, all these tribes have gathered together to begin to talk about the situations that they have and the problems that they have. Um, the nation gets together. There's, there's drumming, there's eating, there's you're seeing friends that you haven't seen in a long time. Like I mentioned before, I'm from New Jersey, so my opportunity to get up here very often uh, is, is not, <clears throat> not too much. Uh, I'm here with my brother and with my son. And so uh, we look forward to this. And we're very excited about what has gone on here and hope that it's done uh, more periodically than uh, what it has been. There's been powwows by the different tribes, the Nolhegan and the Missisquoi, but this is different. This is a conference of uh, different nations getting together and say, hey, how, how can we unify? How can we work together? How can we let the general population know that we're in existence? The state of Vermont, for instance, until we got tribal recognition, really didn't want to admit that we even existed. And that was many years of work by many people. Uh, I was not included with that, but my great-grandmother had kept all of her um, information that she had to say that I was an Abenaki and I did live. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing uh, and describing your regalia for our viewers. Okay.